Okay. Can you all hear me? Yay. All right. So, here I am in a different capacity. It's a bit scary. I'm not usually nervous about being up the front, but today everything looks a little bit different. But first question that I have for you is, am I amongst friends? Yes? yes? Great. Are they friends that will be kind? Yes. yes. Are they friends that will be gracious? Yes. Great. You sound like God. He's kind and he's gracious. So I'm so excited. Thank you for being my friends and being kind and gracious. We are going to go for a bit of a walk today down the road to Emmaus. And we are going to look at Luke 24, 13 to 33. And I really think this is a cool story. But these guys were in a bit of a shambolic state. And I think we might be able to relate to them just a little bit. But before I start with that, I need to get something off my chest. And that is a confession. And I don't know about you, but I've heard that confession is good for the soul. Amen? Yeah, right. So here it is. Well, and my girls are all over there, and they'll be able to say amen to this. I know just about everything, and of course, I'm always right. Isn't that right, Well, Yeah? Uh, <laughs> that means sometimes I don't really listen well, but only sometimes. And uh, it actually means that sometimes I can miss the point and maybe miss an opportunity here or there. Sometimes, just sometimes, I can be driven by my own agenda and I might need to just share all of my pearls of wisdom with anyone that's prepared to listen to them. So it's no surprise that I might have started a minor domestic at home or I might have missed an opportunity to hug one of my daughters who just wanted a hug rather than a life coaching lesson or a problem fix. I don't know. Does that sound familiar to any of you? Yeah, amen, right? <laughs> I'm glad I am amongst friends. So, it's not why I'm here today, though. I'm not here to share my pearls of wisdom. Um, in fact, I'm probably feeling a little bit empty of pearls of wisdom today. So, my hope and prayer is that I would be an empty vessel which God can use to share about a story that we've all heard pretty often, and it's a pretty cool story. Um, in case you're wondering why I'm here and not singing, and you're probably really pleased about that, a little while ago, I was very, very busy in my full-time job and in my ministry here at church and with family stuff and whatnot, and I felt God saying to me, I want you to get up and speak. And I went, mm, I don't think so. I, I think I'm a bit busy for that God. And he wouldn't let that go. And so I thought, okay, well, if that is you saying that to me, then I'm sorry, but you're going to have to confirm that for me. And so Wall and I, as you know, go into the jail on a Sunday afternoon every couple of weeks. And we're sitting there one afternoon earlier this year. And uh, one of the guys, AJ, who you've heard Wall talk about a couple of times, um, he said to me, hey, Jen, just want to talk to you about something. He said, um, just want to let you know that God's put it on my heart to be praying for you for the last couple of months, that you should be getting up and speaking in church. And I went, okay. <laughs> and then Cam, who's a guy that plays the guitar, and Andrew Fairhurst knows him well, and whatnot, he, uh, he said, yeah, so have I. So here I am. Um, and so I, uh, I'm just going to trust that God is going to say something to us today. He's an extravagant God, and he may say something to just one person. And so I'm just going to pray that he uses me. So can I just pray before we start? Father, you are an incredible God, and we've been reminded this morning of how much you love us. We've been reminded that you are trustworthy and that you are faithful, that you are powerful. What a powerful name your name is, Jesus. At this name, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Lord, you are risen you are alive, and we can know you today because of that. So would you please, Lord, use the words that you have given me to share today from your word to just touch everyone, Lord, to challenge us, to maybe help us to reflect a little bit on what you want us to grow into today, more and more like you, Jesus. Amen. Okay, so why do I love the road to Emmaus? The story, it's because it's a human story. And I'm guessing that pretty well everyone here in the room is a human, just like me. Um, we 
don't listen well. We easily lose faith when we walk by sight. We miss his glory. But the risen Jesus restores our hope. And gee, we need him badly, don't we? So we're going to walk together through the road to Emmaus and we're going to maybe catch a glimpse of ourselves as we do that. And as we're doing this, I'm going to read through the passage, but I just want you to maybe close your eyes, maybe do whatever you need to do to really hone in and focus on the story as I read it. Because I want you to put yourself there in the shoes of these two followers of Jesus who are walking along the road. Let's not just look at it from a distance. Let's try and really get in there and walk a mile in their shoes. So here we go. All right, this is from the NLT version. So that same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. And they walked, as they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. And they talked and discussed these things, and Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, Why, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? And they stopped short, sadness written across their faces. And then one of them, Cleopas, he replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there in the last few days. Well, what things, Jesus said. Well, the things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death. And they crucified him. We hoped that he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. But this all happened three days ago. And then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing and that they'd seen angels who told them that Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. And so Jesus said to them, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, by this time, they were nearing Emmaus, and they're at the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he were going on, but they begged him, stay the night with us, since it is getting late. So he went home with them, and as they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it, and then he broke it and he gave it to them. Suddenly, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and at that moment, he disappeared. And they said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 disciples and the others who gathered with them who said, the Lord really is risen. He appeared to Peter. Okay, so we're going to do this in scenes. We're going to be like running a movie as we walk down the road to Emmaus with these guys, well, these two. So it's about midday. It's on the first day of the week, Resurrection Day. We're going to assume it's a fine spring day. It's dusty and dry. The road might be a bit rocky under your feet with the sandals that you've got. You're feeling every stone. The wind's picking up a bit. The sun is beaming down. You're probably squinting. And you know you're on a time limit. You had to be home before dark. So you're headed to Emmaus, and you're aiming to get there before sundown. And you've spent a fair bit of time in Jerusalem with Jesus. You've been hanging out with him. You've been following him around. You've witnessed the events that had led to the crucifixion. And you likely watched the crucifixion happen. You were stunned. It was horrific. You know he was buried. And that there was a great big stone placed across the entrance to his tomb. And then today, you hear this report from some women that the body of Jesus is missing. How do you feel? What's going on for you? 
all of these things. I just don't know what to think. So it's a seven-mile walk to Emmaus from Jerusalem. They were walking fairly slowly. There were two people, Cleopas and somebody else. Now, I just want to say, some of the co commentaries suggest that the other person might have been Cleopas's wife, and that maybe because women are smaller and women are slower, and they drag the chain a bit, that maybe that's why they were going a little bit slow. Now, I want to argue this is probably not the reason that they were going slow. How many of you women out there who have been to the shops, who are on a mission who need to get home to get dinner ready. How many of you dawdle and are walking slow? Mm. So when Wall and I go for a walk together, and when the kids and I go for a walk together, so I say, slow down, slow down. You just have to walk with me. So I'm saying, I don't think it was the reason why they were walking slowly. That's just my view. I don't know about you. Thank you. I told you about that already. I said that already. So maybe it was because they were in really deep conversation. So just remember everything that they'd just seen and the, their expectations. And they're, they're going over this and they're just walking and they're talking and they're mulling and they're chewing it over. They were shattered by everything. You're not hopping and skipping and jumping along if you're shattered. They're having some sort of a post-mortem of the events. And there's no pun intended there because Jesus did die after all. But they're, they're really going over this. They were disappointed. They were in despair, disbelief, and they were disillusioned. Jesus had promised to be the saviour of Israel. And he was crucified. He was dead. And they were pretty perplexed when the women then came and said... Hello, his body is not there. And they go, we saw that he died. We saw he was crucified. What do you mean? Angels said, he's not here. He's alive. So they just don't know what to think. Now, my girls love it when I use a big word. So I'm going to say this for them. They were discombobulated. <laughs> discombobulated means confused and disconcerted. There you go. Um, I want you to do the impossible right now, and I want you to park what you know, this side of history, and really try and be those two. Be full of expectation and hope and promise. But it seems that Jesus just didn't deliver. Did you back the wrong horse? Is that what happened? I want you to think about a time that you've been filled with hope that you were fully expectant of something specific, maybe from Jesus, perhaps an answer to prayer or a promise you felt he'd given you. Maybe it was a time when your world got turned upside down. What did you make of that? How did you feel? You were hanging on, waiting for deliverance, waiting for healing, waiting for provision. It didn't happen. I want you to remember that, because we'll come back to that. But we're going to keep going on our journey. So these guys were walking along. These guys, could have been a guy, could have been a girl, guy and girl. They were walking along, they were in deep discussion about some pretty serious stuff. And suddenly, a random just turns up. They were minding their own business. And he says, hey, what are you guys talking about? So Cleopas goes, mm, um, excuse me? You must be the only guy around that hasn't heard of everything that's been happening around here. Jesus says, hmm, okay, what, what do you mean? What things are you talking about? But let's stop. They had no idea it was Jesus. They had no idea who they were talking to. They were among the group who followed him. They saw and experienced the events. They heard his teaching and had knowledge of who he said he was. They only saw the humanity, not the divinity. They had walked by sight, not by faith. Now, if you were here a couple of weeks ago, Wal preached and he talked about seeing through the circumstance to the glory. 
I think these guys only saw the circumstance. They didn't see through it to God's glory. And I wonder, do we sometimes do that? Do we just look at what we see and forget that there's a bigger picture behind that, that God's working for his glory? I do. So verse 16 says, God actually blinded them to the fact that this was Jesus. And I wonder why. Seems like they needed to be shown the glory and be told the story again and again. So God was about to do that. Seem to. Hope is not lost. Sorry, hope is lost. Jesus is dead. So listen to the gospel according to Cleopas. He retells the stranger his own experience based on all that Jesus had taught him and shown them before he was crucified. So he says, These things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said he was a prophet who did powerful miracles and he was a mighty preacher, a teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and the other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and they crucified him. We had hoped that he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. And then some of the women from the group of his followers were at the tomb early this morning. They came back with amazing report. They saw his body was missing and that they had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Verse 6. It's pretty much everything, isn't it? The ministry of Jesus in word and deed, the crucifixion which completed it, the hope and the redemption which filled it with meaning, the conquered grave and the apostolic witness. What's missing? What's missing? Just the word of the living Christ. The living Christ. Do you ever wonder why Jesus, uh, sorry, Cleopas called Jesus a prophet? He wasn't using the word Lord anymore. He says he's a prophet. We were hoping that he was going to be this Messiah. Well, was he a prophet? Yeah. He actually was a prophet, is a person chosen by God to speak for him and lead the people of Israel to him. And Moses was the first and arguably the greatest of these. So yeah, it was fair enough that Cleopas called Jesus a prophet. But it's also worth noting that he had to choose his words carefully. And I wonder, was that because maybe... He didn't know who he was speaking to. The political unrest of those days meant that maybe if he confessed up to even thinking it might be Jesus, that someone, if if, if it was someone that was looking for Jesus and they thought that these people knew, maybe they'd be arrested. Maybe they'd be killed. So Cleopas is just really careful as well. I do have to ask, though, Is it just that they didn't really know what they believed anymore? We do know that the chief priests knew that the body was missing. And we knew that that wasn't a welcome news for them. So, not really sure. But have you ever had a shattered misconception? Believed something with all your heart and then found out that it wasn't true, wasn't real? You were so blown away, it challenged everything that you believed and your world was just turned upside down. Now, there's a couple of little kitties in the room, not too many, so I can say this out loud. Maybe like Santa? Maybe like the Easter Bunny? Or the Tooth Fairy? Or maybe 9-11? Weren't we all blown away when that happened? What about the Holocaust? Jonestown, 909 mass suicides. Elvis died. Michael Jackson died. Like most of these things are pretty earth shattering, particularly if you're a fan or a follower. You kind of don't believe it, right? You have to just reorient yourself. What about a novel virus called COVID 19 and life in lockdown? Did Did not that turn our world upside down for a bit? Maybe it was broken trust. Maybe someone had let you down big time. Maybe you threw all your funds into an investment and it was a scam. 
Or there was a GFC. Maybe you've been waiting on God for answered prayer. And that thing was a really big deal. And you were absolutely convicted that he was going to deliver. But he didn't. We can relate, can't we? We really can. It can be really hard. You feel really gutted. You question everything. You feel stupid. You may even question your faith. You might even lose it for a while. But these guys were heroes. So we're back on the road. Verse 21. Cleopas. We had hoped he was the Messiah. Israel was under political control of the Roman Empire. And it was tyranny. The Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. What do we do now? So through Jesus they had hoped that God would deliver Israel. But they were still thinking of this in an earthly sense. They were thinking Israel as a political social unit. Just like their ancestors, really. They were looking for an earthly king. Their hope died with Jesus. Dismay, defeat, dreams, shattered. Death of hope. But here is the irony the very thing that they had been holding out hope for was standing right before them, under their nose. And they didn't get it. Their hopes had been 100% fulfilled in the most unexpected and comprehensive way that they could have ever imagined. Now, the report from the women threw them a bit of a cur curveball. It was amazing, and for some might say quite unbelievable. Jesus' body was missing. The angel said he's alive. So what do we do? It was confusing. And their heads are spinning. It was totally an unbelievable report from the women until the men confirmed it. No, I won't say anything more about that. Just leave that one alone. <laughs> um, but to suffice to say, they could not see the forest for the trees. I want to know, if you were Jesus, and this is a big ask, because we're not Jesus, right? But if you were Jesus, what must you be thinking of Cleopas and his tra co-traveller? After everything that you've taught, everything that you demonstrated, everything that you had shown them, what must you be thinking if you were Jesus? I'm thinking he's doing this. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So, scene three. Back to the future. Jesus says, fools. You are foolish people. I feel for these guys, don't you? Like, they're totally, totally turned upside down. They have no idea what to believe. And Jesus says, you foolish people. You are so slow to believe everything that you've been told. You should have known this. Sometimes what Jesus did and said is just way too big for us to understand. No wonder they were so, so slow to get it. You can't blame them, really. So, back to my issue, the confession, the one that says that I... I think I know everything. I was probably always right. Um, yeah. Maybe I'm not. Um, that experience stops me from seeing, stops me from listening, stops me from growing. Sometimes it makes me do more damage than good. So Jesus rebukes them. And he says, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all the prophets wrote in scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? One more time for the dummies, guys. Haven't you heard? Don't you know? And so he is kind enough then to go through everything from the very beginning right through to today. He starts with Moses. He calls out all of the prophecies and he says, these are written about the Christ. Guys, that's me. 
that's next. He doesn't quite reveal that yet. There's a couple, and I won't read them all, but there's Deuteronomy 18.15, there's Psalm 2.7, there's Psalm 16.8-11, there's Psalm 110.1, there's Psalm 118, the whole thing. And there's one of our favourites, Isaiah 53. Pretty much the whole chapter. But there's a particular focus on 8, which says, By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was stricken. So those references all talk a lot about the suffering that Jesus had to go through. When Jesus speaks, he talks about the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory. So the focus has shifted a bit now. He's talking about his glory because it's real, it's present, it's current. It was real for him today. He'd waited so long for that. He'd asked for that cup to be taken away from him, but he drank it through obedience. Now, these guys, they listened, and they were enthralled by what he had to say, and they, they were thinking, yeah, yeah, we've heard this before. We know this. We know this story. But they still didn't understand who he was. They were distracted by the human, not the glory. So, we're nearly back home to Emmaus. It's getting dark, and in all likelihood, it's probably not safe to travel any further. So the conversation's pretty, o- pretty much over, and Jesus he starts to pretend that he's going to keep going. He's acting as if, I'm on my way, guys. Thanks for the chat. Good chat. And they say, wait, wait, wait. It's getting dark. The day's nearly done. Why don't you come and stay with us? And he did so simple hope is restored christ is risen indeed so jesus reclines at their table and he shares a meal of fellowship with them now it's not a big messianic banquet and it's not the lord's supper it was just a simple meal after a big day people were very overwhelmed a bit hot and bothered it was dark they were tired so they sat down now for some reason jesus is the one that breaks the bread. Now, the commentary suggests that that's maybe because he's the older one, so I'm thinking Cleopas and his uh, partner might have been a bit younger. But he was given, maybe it was because he was the guest of honour. He was given the role of breaking the bread. And soon as he broke the bread and he gave thanks, the veil was lifted. Finally, they got to see who it was that they were talking to. The one that they had been agonying over. The one that they had hoped would save Israel and would save them. But he disappears. He disappears. Why? He vanished into thin air. Why? Seems like maybe they didn't need his physical presence anymore. He had done enough to prove that he was indeed alive. He rose. The stories were true. The report of the women were true. What the angels were said, said was true. And they finally understood what all of his story, his story, what all of that meant. He was alive. Now, that was always God's plan. Penny dropped, the light bulb went on. They're like, oh yeah, of course. They were probably more surprised about the fact that he died than the fact that he actually revealed himself. They were a little bit more, oh, yeah, yeah, I got it, yeah, oh, this is awesome. And so they said, once he disappeared, our hearts were burning. We knew when he was talking to us on the road to Emmaus, we knew that there was something. He was teaching with authority. He knew all that we had already heard. It it was something that stirred, but we just couldn't put our finger on it. I think now they were the ones going, oh, doing the face plant, right? Anyway, they were so excited. They ran back to Jerusalem. Doesn't matter it was nighttime anymore. Doesn't matter it wasn't particularly safe. They were so excited. They were on a beeline straight back to Jerusalem. And they spoke to their friends their friends shared a story 
that Jesus was alive because he'd spoken to Peter. Do you know, he, Jesus revealed himself about a dozen times within the 40 days after his resurrection. Mary and the women on the first day, the travellers, these travellers on the road to Emmaus, Peter in Jerusalem, the disciples in the upper room, the disciples a week later in the upper room, a number of times to the disciples in Galilee, to more than 500 people, to James later and at his ascension. There was a lot of times, but why did he need to do that? It was the empirical proof that he indeed had risen, physically risen from the dead. You know, we talked about the empty cross last week at Easter. We've still got the cross up. He is risen, and this matters to us today. It mattered to them because they were confused and just didn't know how, what it all meant. But it matters to us today because he has risen. It's the proof that they needed, that he was who he said he was. It's the proof that we need, that he is who he said he is. He is alive today. Do you know that without that truth, without that fact, without the witnesses being recorded in history to say that they actually saw, touched and felt Jesus, there is no point to our faith, is there? It's a warm, fuzzy, nice story about a good teacher who was pretty cool. He had a lot of followers. This is so important. His resurrection and the sightings, the witnesses to that, are the evidence that has been recorded in history that gives us confidence. And of course, our confidence also comes because we now have Jesus living in us. The Holy Spirit convicts us that he is alive. Our story, our testimony, when we meet with him, he changes us. He is alive. Hallelujah. I want to take you back to that point that I said, think about that, remember that. That time where you thought God was speaking to you, the time where you felt certain that he had something for you, the time where you felt like you'd lost hope and gave up. A time maybe that your heart was on fire and you were called to do something, to act, to call someone, to follow, to, to stand up and preach, whatever. But you missed it? Was that hard? When you look back on that and you go, oh my gosh, I missed that. I totally missed that. In hindsight, we see so clearly. You might still have some of those things that have turned your world upside down. You might still be feeling like you're wandering in the dark a little bit. But because of history, because of his story, we know that that is not the end. The disciples thought it was the end, game over, going home. It was all a great idea at the time. We can be tempted, can't we, to think that. Like, I'm, I've waited all this time. I think this is not happening. Or God, I don't think you hear me anymore. Remember, there is always glory behind the story. There is always glory behind the thing that you're wrestling with. The disappointment, the darkness, the despair. He doesn't leave you there. He always has a purpose in that for you. We've got a favourite Bible verse. It says all things, it's in Romans, it says all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Jesus was called according to the purpose of the Father. He was obedient to death on a cross. 
he asked, God, can you just take this cup from me because it's getting a bit much? So no, I'm going to do this, Father, because it's your will, not mine. I want you to think, and we're going to move into faith space, I'm going to invite Trudy up in a sec. She's going to lead it, but I want you to think about those times where you have felt, at least at face value, that God wasn't there, that he didn't show up for you. And then I want you to remember, or want you to think about the time that you remembered then or saw, that hang on a minute, he actually did have a plan in that. There was a plan that was far bigger than I could have ever imagined, far cleverer than I could have ever thought, far more amazing. His grace is amazing. Don't give up. Never lose hope. It's written on my wrist, you can't see it. I've got a tattoo of hope on my wrist because I went through some really dark times in my life and I remembered that Jesus was my hope. My hope was built on nothing less. That reminds me all the time. You may or may not like tattoos. I actually happen to like them a bit, but that is there as a reminder to me to never lose hope in Jesus, who is my rock and my salvation. So can I encourage you, do whatever it is, to continue to remember that Jesus is your hope. He is alive. Your story will show his glory. He will always come through. Trudy, do you want to come up and lead us in faith space? And can I encourage you guys to be courageous and with those things that you were thinking about, maybe just share them. We're human and we hurt and things are hard. It's really good, though, to know that you're not alone. It's really encouraging to hear that God's worked with you on something. And you're out the other side now. Praise God. He's alive. Amen. So we are going to go into faith space. But I just, um, listening to Jen, thank you, Jen, for leading us. And, um, you know, Jen felt God led her to that. And she was very vulnerable for us. So as her loving friends, family, church, let's thank her.